this a moment of silence as a believer priest and dwelt by the Holy Spirit, privilege to confess sin if necessary. If you're with us tonight by the internet, we encourage you to do the same thing, not to be distracted, to hold everything for an hour of Bible study with us without distraction so you can keep your concentration on the Word of God. Let the Holy Spirit, you got to be filled with the Holy Spirit. you got to have the presence of Him, and you have it. If you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, he, he died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead to give you life everlasting. When you believe that, the Holy Spirit indwells your life. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, your body becomes the temple of God because it has been purchased through the purchase price of Christ on the cross. 1 John 1, 9 is important because if we confess our sins, it could be mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue, or overt sins. When we confess them, we are restored to sanctification, not salvation. And that is the ministry of the Holy Spirit, and you have to have it to study the Bible. So it could be mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue, or overt sins. That would be three categories to look at. And if you're aware of any, and you will be if there is sin in your life and there's carnality, then you confess it and get into the spiritual life. Let the Holy Spirit teach you tonight. We're thankful tonight, Father, for these that have come and parked the car and walked in and sat down face to face, as Hebrews 10, 25 says, forsake not the assembly of yourselves together. And I'm thankful for those who are local are able to do that. For those traveling with us by the Internet, then it's pick us up. Do not forsake the assembly of, your gather, of yourselves together to learn. And as you learn, become an assembly of local believers uh, interested in evangelizing and, and teaching your people in your own nation. So we're thankful tonight. Pray, Father, we look at, at the importance of the prophet Samuel. Not the guy who went to preschool not the guy who was a judge most of his life, but the guy who was the prophet, the first prophet to the theocracy monarchy who built a, a magnificent school that ran all the way to the coming of Christ. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. When you read uh, 1 Samuel 3, in the calling which we have, the when he was <clears throat> being tutored by Eli in priesthood, remember his mother Hannah gave them to him. There's something interesting in that time period when he was under Eli's tutorage. And it's recorded in the third chapter, verses 19 through 21, and I'm pulling out verse 20. Again, it's a good read for you. All Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, which means from one end of the nation of the land, the promised land, from one end of the promised land to the other end. Dan is up there and Beersheba is down here. And that means the entire, there was nowhere in Israel, in the land of Israel, in the promised land, that did not know this. All Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, knew that Samuel was confirmed as a prophet of the Lord. That's pretty powerful, isn't it? I mean, there's probably, it, they're not, that couldn't be said of most anybody today in Jefferson County. It couldn't be said of me. Not everybody in Jefferson County know who I am or what I do. I mean, this is quite a statement in a day when, you know, it was word of mouth, wasn't it? And you know who does that stuff? The Lord. The Lord promotes your ministry. You don't need to blow your own horn. Tooting your own horn is only good for those who live with you. And if you toot it very much, they don't care about it. He was confirmed. All of Israel confirmed him as the prophet of the Lord. In our national address, which is when he addresses the nation, his State of the Union address, his final one, <clears throat> which is recorded in chapter 12, 
he is in a, he is closing down the judgeship and opening up the monarchy, and everybody believes that he is the voice of God in it. Nobody's challenging him. The the news media is not challenging him. The the other parties not challenging. Him, you know, I mean, because they understood that that he spoke for the Lord, which is kind of interesting. Um, um, They've asked for a king. <clears throat> they went to him. They've asked for a king. He's the guy. And so he's going to tell them what it means as the voice of God. And, and that's kind of interesting. He, he has a powerful ministry with an apostate people. He has a powerful ministry with apostate people. Only God can do that kind of a thing. I mean, in your flesh, you would just destroy him. I mean, there's no way in your flesh you'd go get a job at Walmart or something. You'd leave the ministry working with these people. Unless you're sent by God. In, his, in, this, in this address, Samuel warns the Israelites in verse 20, Do not turn aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all of your heart. You can, he tells them, what the bottom line is between your relationship with God. The bottom line in your relationship with the Lord is to serve him with all of your heart. Not some of it, not some of the time. All of your heart, all of the time. And you know the only person can control that is you. Nobody else can control that. <laughs> only you, because God gave you volition. Calvin was downstairs teaching my grandson, Jacob. Now, he's a handful. <clears throat> Calvin gave me a coin, a Horton coin, said that, <coughs> tell Jacob he had some things that he had to tell me from Bible study in order to get that coin that he had passed it off to me. Well, I was all for that. So at dinner, I said to him, you got something you and I need to talk about? And, of course, everybody's eyes bulged out, and they looked at me like, oh, man. <laughs> when you go to Grandpa, <laughs> so everybody's, they gasp, especially Billy and his mother. <laughs> they gasp. You've been sent to Grandpa? <laughs> <laughs> he said, yeah, but it's good, Ma. And they were studying the essence. And I'll tell you, that was a great lesson. That little kid got it. He, he said, I've been, we've been studying the essence of God. And, you know, it's, God is all, all smart, all powerful and all that. I'm like, yeah. He said, well, the, the, the key is that word all. Now, that thing is spelt kind of funny. It's a O M. I don't know. But it means all. I said, yeah. And he says, <clears throat> and I've got a passage I've got to read to you, and then I, I, you got something for me, right? I went, yeah. And so he turned to Colossians, the first chapter, nailed that thing right there in a passage that refers to all this and all that and all this and all that. And he was able to go in there and use the word all and describe the essence of God in the dynamics of a personal life. You know how long... It took me to learn that. <laughs> no, I don't know. He's in the fourth grade. Let me tell you, it's not how smart he is. It's how good a teacher Calvin was. That was really good. I mean, he whipped, he whipped that word of God open on me. And, uh, I mean, er, even his parents went like, whoa. And then I gave him what I call the elite coin. That's the big heavy one, the big bronze heavy one. I mean, everybody wants that one. <laughs> well, anyhow, job well done. A job well done. And that when I read a passage like this, uh, serve the Lord with all of your heart. That's what, if he was in here, he'd caught that word all. He said it's, it's spelled kind of funny. It's M O something. But it means all. Grandpa, it means all. And uh, 
I mean, I think sometimes, I mean, sometimes you serve downstairs and there are a handful to serve, to, and you don't, you think, I ain't getting through. These kids just hijack my class. <laughs> and then there's a moment like that, and everybody goes like, cha-ching. And that's, that's good stuff. You know, you, you live for those moments, don't you? When it, it, you, you wish you could have that all the time, but you don't. <laughs> but when, they, when you do have them, it's, it's something in it. And it, it, was, it was sure something good for Grandpa that I needed that. It, it came at a good time, and it came from just a wonderful little guy you think isn't listening, <laughs> at least not listening to what you want him to listen to. <laughs> that's, that's so that was a, even his even his uh, older brother went like whoa. I'm gonna have to get I'm gonna have to get it, I'm gonna have to get my Bible out a little bit, but little buddy. Uh, let me let me talk about six things here today. Um, number one, <clears throat> both as a judge and a prophet, Samuel, and this is really really good about him. God had had trained him. Uh, through a difficult ministry in judges, working with the judges and apostasy, <clears throat> had taught him how to be a spiritual reformer, how to get people to change their, their minds and their hearts. And although he didn't have large meetings like Billy Graham for this, he was slowly having an inroad, one by one, two by two, three by three, whatever, he, because he was a spiritual reformer, and God taught him how to do it, and that's really going to pay dividends as he sets up the school of biblical of theology to train the sons of the prophets to do this type of ministry. It, it, it's going to serve, and, and that's God in it. That's how God does stuff. He just uses your life and trains you all over the place with all different kinds of stuff to get you where you are today, and that's pretty amazing. And we all probably would say, yeah, I'm glad where I am. I wouldn't want to have to go in through any of the stuff that got me here again. Uh, but in 1 Samuel 12, 23 through 25, for moreover, as for me, far be it from me, he said, that I should sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you, which is a big ministry. If you want to see spiritual reform in your nation, well, we call it transform in the Christian church, but in the nation, it's reform. You want to see people turn back to the Lord and, and, and come back to divine institutional thinking, some of the standard things that people can do? You have to pray for it. You, you know, we sit around and we grumble and gripe. We never pray for it. Somebody came in the other day, and he was just all fired up, and he was, he was mad as an old wet hen, as we say up north. And, and uh, I mean, he just went, yeah, 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 yeah. <clears throat> and, you know, courtesy, you let him, yeah, 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 yeah. And when he got through, I said, look, can we just have a word of prayer? And it was like, if this is a believer, and he was kind of like shocked. Huh? <laughs> I mean, you laid a whole lot out that we need to pray about. And I was writing stuff down on a napkin. And, uh, my, you know, I, I had a napkin full of stuff that he was complaining about. I said, well, let's stop and have a word of prayer and get it done. Let's go through your list and get this off. Get this off and talk about something that's important in our life. I mean, I'm not saying that's not, but listen, I'm I'm more concerned about people's souls where they're going. So you know, let's get this done, and then let's get into some of the issues that the church should be concerned with. And so anyhow, uh, prayer, and then the second thing is teaching but I will instruct you in good and right ways. And that's kind of like the theme of this school. I mean, this is a little phrase, if you would pay attention to it, you're going to see this over and over again with him and with his guys. It's, it's kind of an interesting. Only fear the Lord and serve him with truth with all of your heart. And that, that is what his school was all about. Consider, always, always remember what great things God has done for you. You know, when this guy got through, I said to him, I said, you know what? I, I know what you're saying, but you know what I do? I stop and I reflect. I, I'm fortunate. I, I was raised in a wonderful time period in America. 
And so when I look at all this, I, I just, I, I'm just so thankful that I was, ra and I was raised by the people who raised me. You know, I am so thankful for my grandparents that just stretched out, had their kids raised and took, you know, a little kid in and, and just loved them and made them family. I'm so thankful for that. And, uh, and he, and he says, one of the things you need to do is you need to pray for, pray for your nation. You need to instruct the people of your nation. And then he says, you need to remember the great things, the great things that God has done for you. And you know, that'll take you a long way, won't it? No matter what goes on in your life, you stop and say, look, look, if, if I've been so through so much, <laughs> put it on the plate. I'll eat it. I mean, I know God is able, right? God is able. And after a couple of those experiences, you got that down, haven't you? Look, I know I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to live for tomorrow, and that would be okay. I'm going to live through this, whatever this is, but I, because I'm going to look back, and I know God is faithful. I can look back on my life. I can look back on my life. I can look back on my life, and I can say God is faithful. That, and that's what he says. Th these, are, these are three things that we ought to be doing in a nation that's apostate. But if you still do witness, know this, both, both you and your nation are going to go. Samuel is mentioned. This is interesting to me, too. Samuel is mentioned in the fourth book of the Psalms. You know, Psalms is, is, is divided into five books. Mm -hmm. And you always pay attention to that when you're reading things. You always pay attention to these sections of the book. Now, if you've got a good study Bible, they'll tell you that in the front of you. You know, when you, your introduction, it'll tell you that there are five sections. You really pay attention because, listen, some of these sections are just loaded with Messianic prophecy. And if you get into, if you run into a chapter that's got pro Messianic prophecy, go back and look at the book, look at that, and then read that book. It's going to be, that book is all about it. Then, see, it's just so much easier to know that. So I'm giving you, giving you a heads up on it. So when you get to the fourth book of the five books of Psalms, and I, I put them down for you just in case you didn't know it. The fourth book of the Psalms is 90 through 106. Now, see, when, when I was running references out on Samuel as a prophet, I found him in, I found him in Psalms 99. I found him in Psalms 99, verses 5 through 9. So I want you to go there with me. So as soon as I found him in Psalms, I went, well, okay, because I, I, I forget what books they're in. And so I look back, and I went, oh, yeah, I got this. He's in the fourth book. And, and then I, I tell you what I found in the fourth book. I found, I found Moses, and I found Samuel. I found these great prophets to the nation. So when I found him in 99, mentioned, I, I immediately went back and I looked what book he was in. And then I, I found that in chapter 90, we have a prayer of Moses. And I went, oh, wow, I know what I'm into now. And so in, the, in 99, I want you to watch something here. What he does, uh, verses 5 through 9, show you that. Because I want to show you what he does. It's a in his work. Look at verse 5. Watch this now. Exalt the Lord our God and worship. Are you with me? Look at verse 9. Exalt the Lord our God and worship. That's a big deal for Samuel. It was a big deal for his school. It is a big deal. Exalt the Lord our God and worship. Now, in that section, 5 through 9, in verse 6 and 7, now remember that you're in a section of Moses and some of the great prophets. In verse 6, he says, Moses and Aaron were among his priests, and Samuel was among those who called on his name. They called upon the Lord, and he answered them. He was a prophet. And he, he spoke to them in the pillar of the cloud, and then he goes on and he talks about this. Remember that, the, remember that what this is about is reminding the people 
to exalt the Lord your God in worship. And he mentions Moses and Samuel. And it's in this great section called the fourth book of the Psalms, which tells you a lot. Okay, tells you a whole lot. Exalt the Lord. These three ministered, and that is Moses, um, Aaron, uh, and Samuel. These three ministered during the time of great apostasy. What in common? Well, they ministered in a time of great apostasy. For example, you, uh, Jeremiah. In Jeremiah, the 15th chapter, verse 1, it says, Jer well, let's just look. We're not going to come back to Psalms anyhow. Jeremiah 15. We're right close to it. I'm close, you know, as the crow flies. Uh, 15.1. What's this? Now, now, now we got, we're into Jeremiah, who's one of the prophets from a school. I mean, this school is going to produce prophets all the way to the coming of Christ. Now, they're going to have a big gap in there, and the Lord's going to have to pull out, pull the last one out called John the Baptist. But then the Lord said to me, even though Moses and Samuel, the Lord said to me, even though Moses and Samuel were to stand before me, my heart would not be with this people. I mean, you know what he's saying? These two men were spiritual reformers who prayed and instructed and encouraged to serve God with their whole heart. These two guys, these two guys, this is what they were known for. And this was what Samuel tried to get all of the sons of the prophets, and listen, there were a lot of them, to get in their heart and to teach the people. Teach it in your city. Teach it, tra travel and teach this across the nation. My heart would not be with his people. Send them away from my presence and let them go. Je that's Jeremiah talking about these two guys, Moses and Samuel. Hebrews, the third chapter, and cha third and fourth chapter, deals with the apostasy during Moses. The apostasy during Moses' ministry. And here's what the writer of Hebrew describes it. That, that's the... That's, that's the coming out of the exodus and in the wilderness wandering, Hebrews 3 and 4. And he said, verse 12 is a key verse. It, this kind of describes uh, what the writer's concerned with in his, he said, take care, brethren, that there, there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from a living God. That kind of characterized the, the first generation of the exodus whose carcasses fell in the wilderness under the sun, with the exception of three guys, right? And only two got in. Even that's tough, isn't it? At the end of the judgeship, of the judge period, at the end of the period of judgeship, and at the beginning of the theocracy monarchy, we're aware that we are now into Samuel's ministry, and you have the same apostasy going on. In the judge, the last chapter and the last verse of Judges says, in those days there was no king in Israel and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And Samuel has set out to change that deal. That he's got, they've got to be instructed in the good and right way to go. Okay? Then point number three. God raised Samuel up to train the sons of the prophet to be called for ministry to the priest nation of Israel. We know Samuel established the school of biblical theology throughout the tribal territory of Benjamin. When you see the sons of the prophets, which you only see, uh, all of a sudden they come up in the scriptures and it's during the period of Samuel. And they're going to work out of Benjamin What tribe did Saul come from? Well, it could be a gate question, so I'm going to leave it hang with you. Okay? But 
the city of Gagal, Jericho, Bethel, uh, the the Ark of the Covenant was was kept for a pretty good while at Kurgash uh, Zaram. These were all school, where schools of, of theology were taught under Samuel. And if you look at Benjamin, these are all key places on the border around. And he lived at Ra Ramah, right in the middle, right in the heart of it. And, and we... You'll see these names all the times connected. You'll see these sons of the prophet uh, coming from Jericho or going to Jericho. You'll see them coming from Bethel or going to Bethel. You, you'll see them all the time. People don't know what they did. And they, they resided at school. That's where they lived and they went to school and, and uh, ministered from there out. It's just interesting. Um, you can read more about this. You can really see this, the way these prophets are working through, the, through these cities in uh, 2 Kings 2. Just look for it. When you, when you read through it, just look for these sons of the prophet and where they're coming and going from. That helps you. King Saul. King Saul, he, 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 you know, there's probably not a more inter interesting guy to study than King Saul. King Saul had a life life experience. He he had a life changing experience with some of Samuel's prophets in 1 Samuel 10, 1 through 16. I'm not going to study that whole thing with you tonight, but it's again it's one of those good reads um, where God is trying to do something with this guy, and he's just out to lunch, like so many. And I picked out verse 6, but remember this is in the Jewish age. Then the Spirit of the Lord, then the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you mightily, and you shall prophesy with them and be changed into another man. That's what, that's what Samuel told Saul. Okay. The Holy Spirit. See? That's because the Holy Spirit would come mightily upon him. Now look, that's the same Holy Spirit that lives in us mightily. Every one of you in here has this Holy Spirit that they're talking about came upon him mightily and changed him into another person. We take all that for granted. Listen, do you see the Holy Spirit work mightily in you? Because that's his character. His character is to work mightily in us, mightily. You know what that word is in the Greek language? The word work mightily is dunamis. It's where you get the English word dynamite. Or Today we're way past that, aren't we? We're way past that. But in the Jewish age, to have that happen, whoa, that was something. And listen, when, when, when David sinned and got caught, got caught in the trap of the whole business and got it, boy, the one thing he didn't want was the Holy Spirit removed from him. I mean, he begged that deal. Here, here's the fourth thing. One of the things I was always interested in was what was the curriculum? So you have to go in and you really have to study the sons of the prophets. And here's what I found. I found, I found four things. There's probably a lot more, Johnny. It's just, you know, after a while your eyes cross and you fall asleep on your desk and the phone rings and you say, Jesus, it's 12 o'clock, I better go to bed. I've been asleep two hours on my desk. But here's what you find. They were, they were trained in uh, music and worship. You know what they sang? Sang the Bible. And, and then they wrote hymns, nodes. They, they did doctoral stuff. Was, we do it. We do it too. We don't, we don't sing songs because nobody knows how it goes. You know, we sing very few songs because we just don't know how they go. 
Ed Jones could probably find the music for us. Ed could, I think Ed could actually drop back into this day in his soul and, and, and come up with the music. He's a phenomenal guy. If you want to know about the musical aspect of their training, you can read about First Chronicles 25. I mean, whoa, when you read that, you go like, I mean, very few people, only, a, only Scoot. Scoot Ward knows all about First Chronicles 25. He's the only guy I ever knew that even get a hoot about it. Scoot Ward. Um, also, this, this is part of that 1 Samuel 10, 5 and 6. Part, part of that business is in that. And, of course, then the Word of God in theology, I mean, we would understand that. You could read about that in 1 Kings 20, 35 through 43. And see how it works. <laughs> you can see how God's, the Lord says, says, says to Samuel, send out one of the songs of the prophet, one of the sons of the prophet. I got the songs of the prophet. I'm, I'm thinking Western or something, I guess. Sons of the prophet here or something. And he sends about a task for him. And boy, you need to read that too. Not now. You ought to see, I mean, Calvin, this is an assignment that maybe on the way out there you thought, oh, wow. It gave him an assignment, and boy, was that an assignment. And then prophetic teaching. The, the, the prophetic teaching was a big deal. 1 Samuel 19, 18 through 24. And Samuel, this, this is during a meeting between Samuel and David at Ramah. And uh, <laughs> that's Saul was, boy, this, this guy is an idiot, but in, in a nice way, I guess. Um, listen, Samuel here, you know, he's after David. David and Samuel have met at Ramah. They've had a, a personal private meeting. And somebody blabs to King Saul that David is out there with Samuel. So he sends some of his soldiers out to arrest and bring him back. So he sends a detachment out. They get out there. They meet the sons of the prophet and they all become, they all fall down and begin to prophesy. So they have to go back because they, they don't know what they've come for, but they know what they're taking back. They're all going back with prophecy uh, for the king. So he sends out an another detachment. Brings some tougher guys out. Now go out there and get this guy. Uh, I, can't, I can't send lieutenants. I need some captains. Take you captains, go. They send them out there. The sons, the sons of the prophet meet them. They all began to prophesy. First thing, they're down prophesying. They, they forgot what they came for. So they go back and, get, and talk about prophecy. And this goes on and on and on. This goes on and on and on. It's too good to be true. It's too good to be true. And so Saul says, you know, don't leave it to a bunch of kids. You want something done, do it yourself. Did you have a parent like that? I did. Well, if you want it. Well, the only thing I've learned from you, son, today, if you want it done, you better go do it yourself. <laughs> I, can still hear, I can still see her face. Oh, that's, that's sad, ain't it? So Saul goes out. If you want a job done, go do it yourself. Guess what happens to him? He meets the sons of the prophets. <laughs> And the first thing we know, he's down there prophesying. And listen, he did it so much and so fancy, you know. I mean, he, I mean, he did it so far out that he got a reputation. He was called is Saul also among the prophets. He built, he had a reputation. He never got rid of it. Somewhere on his tombstone is this is written. 
Saul must have been one of the prophets because when he went out there, the same thing happened to him, except he got crazy with it. It's just funny. It's, it's probably a lot funnier if you'd read it. And then the other reason that I found for the School of Biblical Theology was to create a pool from which the Lord could pull uh, national prophets. When he needed a national prophet, he had a pool. And he started, and that's where he got all of them from this point on. Everyone, e Elijah coming from the pool. Elisa coming from the pool. Uh, Jeremiah, I mean, you name it, they're coming from this pool. It's a big deal. <laughs> it's a lot bigger deal than I'm making it. The sons of the prophet were a much larger group than most people imagine. You can read about this in 1 Kings 19, which is really interesting. This is Ahab and Jezebel, and this is coming off from Eli, uh, 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 Elijah going to Mount Carmel and having a duel with the prophets of Baal. Remember that story? Well, this is, this is when, when, when uh, the word gets back to Jezebel that he's killed, he, that he's killed all of her prophets. And she said, well, I'll not rest till he's, till he's de dead or in the doornail. So, so he is on a run. I mean, this guy can kill hundreds and hundreds of men and runs from one woman. Does that tell us guys anything? Is there a message here for us? You know, they talk about a woman scorned. Holy macro. I don't know. I don't even want to meet her. Um, but, but is that not good? Somebody has apparently said that. So I, I, I'm afraid to even test the waters on that deal. So, but anyhow, when you go in there, you'll see this. Now, in chapter 18 and, and 19, this is a wonderful chapter on this. But one of the things you got to pay attention to is that he, he says, here's, here's Elijah, Elijah's mindset. It is, I'm alone. I'm all alone. I'm all alone. And so he runs off. He gets in a cave. I'm all alone. Except for you, Father. But, you know, I guess I don't count, really. I'm all alone. This is his theme. I'm all alone. I'm all alone. You know, you're never all alone. Come on, people. When you're whining like that, it's just, it's just dumb. You're never alone. He, he whines he's alone in a cave and then talking to God. I mean, how dumb is that? How can you be, are you talking, who are you talking? Well, I'm not, you talking to yourself? No, I'm talking to God. Well, how could you be alone? You can't even be alone with yourself. You talk to yourself and you're not even alone. You can't even be alone with yourself. Well, he starts whining to the Lord in the cave, right? He starts whining to the Lord. Oh, Lord, I'm all alone. I've got an army on them all alone. And he says, are you the master of the school of theology? Are you the headmaster? Well, yeah, but <laughs> I'm all alone. He said, well, let me tell you, I've kept account. There are 7,000 that have, listen to me now, 7,000 that haven't bowed their knee to Baal. And you're sitting in a cave whining. You've done a good job, but you don't even realize it. What do you mean I'm all alone? Your boys, you got 7,000 boys out there doing a job, and you're in a cave hiding. You got seven out there in the front line fighting. That's what he's told them. I mean, that's what he told them. You're the commanding general sitting in a, sitting in a cave. You got 7,000 men out there fighting your fight. Get back on your feet and get out there. Just sit in here and whine. Hey, let me show you something in Romans. Picking that subject up in, in the book of Romans, the 11th chapter of Romans. I mean, you can find Samuel everywhere. In Romans, the 11th chapter... Verses 1 through 6, Romans 11. I say then, God has, has not rejected his people, has he? May it never be. For I, 
to him an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Or do you not know what the scripture says in the passage about Elijah? How he pleaded with God against Israel. Lord, they've killed thy prophets. They've torn down thine altars. And I alone am left. And they're seeking my life. What is the divine response to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed their knee to Baal. In the same way then, there has also come to be at this present time a remnant according to God's gracious choice. For it, if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of work. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. Listen. If you've done your job, you have no idea how many foot soldiers out there preaching the message of grace. You've preached it and preached it. You don't have to see it. God has to see it. He's got foot soldiers out of the message of grace that comes from your pulpit. Stop whining. Paul, that has meaning to Paul's life in Romans 11. It, it was a thought of encouragement to Paul. And an encouragement to me as a result. That's powerful. Point five. Within this group of prophets, God would select a national prophet such as he did with Elijah and with Elisha, who were graduates of Samuel's School of Biblical Theology. National prophet, whoever was the national prophet, was the headmaster of the school. Whichever prophet that was. And that's good to remember as you read other guys like Jeremiah and Ezekiel and guys like that. It's good to remember that. Then the sons of the prophets. Here is 2 Kings 2.3. Then the sons of the prophets who were at Bethel came out to Elisha. This is when Elijah is going to go back. And came to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that the Lord will take away your master from you today? Said, I sure do. Sure do. What do you think? I'm not a prophet? <laughs> you can't keep a secret for prophets, you know that. <laughs> there are no secrets among them. Not if they're good. Uh, when prophets come to him said, Hey, hey, do you know the Lord's going to take your master today? Said, Sure do. Sure do. I can say mail. I can say mail that you do. You see, the sons of the prophets, whether from Bethel or from Jericho or from one of the other cities, they knew it. And listen, they all knew who their master was. It was Samuel, then it was Elijah, then it was Elisha. You're going to see it in this chain of events. Now, 50 men of the, men of the sons of the prophet went and stood opposite them at a distance while the two, two of them stood by the Jordan. And we know how that th this is going to go. Elijah is going to go up in a whirlwind and everybody else is going to become one. Now, when the sons of the prophets who were at Jericho opposite him saw, them, saw him, they said, the spirit of Elijah now rests on Elisha. That, and he's going to become their master now, the master of school of biblical theology. And they came to meet him and bowed down, bowed before him to the ground before him. That's why? Because he's the new master of the school. Here's my final point. Following the five, fifth cycle to Judah in 586 B.C., <clears throat> there were no prophets to the priest nation throughout the interbiblical period from Malachi. Once you leave Malachi, we enter into no man's land as far as prophets. We don't hear from them again until we find John the Baptist. And it stirs a whole interest in the, in the school of Samuel's Prophets. It, it brings all of that back. 400 years this thing has led. And now John the Baptist has stirred up that whole Samuel prophet's interest in Israel. And they start asking some really interesting questions. That Jews knew about the prophecy of, of Moses in Deuteronomy 18, 15 through 18. But they couldn't figure out whether it referred to, in prophecy, to John the Baptist or to Jesus. And so you have this discussion 
You, this whole thing is discussed in John, the first chapter, 19 through 34, which quotes Isaiah 40, verse 3. It's discussed in the book of Acts. I wrote it on your paper, the third chapter, the seventh chapter. The seventh chapter is, you know, that's Stephen going over the history. And he brings us out. But I want you to, I want to close with you going to me to Matthew. I want to show you something in Matthew. Because, and I love this about this, this thing has, this, the, the school of, of biblical theology has laid silent for 400 years. And John the Baptist shows up as, as, uh, as mysterious almost as Samuel does. And, um, and it stirs great interest. I mean, large crowds were going to listen to John the Baptist. And listen, I'm going to tell you the same thing happened to John the Baptist that happened to Samuel. God broadcasted that there is a prophet in the land from Dan to Beersheba. I mean, everybody in Israel was talking about John the Baptist being a prophet sent from God. But in Matthew, the 16th chapter of Matthew, I, this is not on your paper. I just happened to think about it, wrote it down coming in. In the 16th chapter, I'll pick up at, um, I'll pick up, well, I'll pick up at the bottom of verse 13. I mean, Matthew 16, verse 13, looking at the bottom, when his disciples, uh, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? We're familiar with that question. They said, now watch their answer. Some say, well, some say John the Baptist Others say Elijah, some Jeremiah, and others one of the prophets. He says to them, but who do you say I am? But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter. You got to love this guy. Simon Peter blurts out, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God, and Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say, also say to you uh, that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not overpower it. And he goes on to make a discussion with it. I mean, Peter nailed it. Peter nailed it. Yeah. Yeah. And I tried to talk about it. But he got that one, didn't he? He got. And what they're talking about is the general opinion within the nation of Israel about this prophet, the, this prophet that's in the land. And it seems like we have to remember that the woman at the well, when Jesus was talking to her, she said, you know, I, I, I presume that you are a prophet. And he said, I'm much more than that. And... Uh, well, anyhow. Yeah, and uh, 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 we want to pray for Tony and Claudia. Tony's having sharp pains in his arm, and so they're concerned about that. And, and then we have a praise report from uh, J J Janice Sanders, uh, which she, she got a good report. And so, I mean, that's a, that's a lot of stuff to be, be thankful for tonight. I know that's a happy family tonight to have that news. But let me tell you, that family, that family would have taken that news good however it came from the Lord because there's a family that serves the Lord with their whole heart. And, and, but I'm, I'm, I'm glad for them. I'm glad for them. Okay, well, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we're thankful tonight for this opportunity to be in assembly without censorship except what we put on ourselves, and we pray we didn't put any on ourselves. We want to censor the word of, word of truth in our hearts. I want to thank you for the report we got on Janice. I know I, I the pray for her and the kids and the marriages and the families that are associated with them. I know their, their extended families as well. Thank you, Father. Um, boy, won't that be something? Won't that be something to to write about and look at and to see all the ministry that flew that flowed from her life and, and will continue. 
but that's the Sanders, and we're thankful to be a part of their life and part of their journey. And uh, we left Tony before you tonight. Heard that he's got this sharp pain in the left arm. You know, we always take that as not a good sign, but uh, as far as health. But we lift him before you, Father, and pray that the medical staff that will deal with him will deal with him wisely and be on top of their game medically and be able to resolve something from this, whatever it might be. We pray that he would understand, having gone through Claudia, how important it is to understand the ministries attached to all of this. That he is, he will now meet people he would never met any other way but this way. Not to focus on himself as much as those who are, are treating him. There's a spiritual point to all of it too. So we're thankful for that. Thank you for these who have come our way tonight, Father. Thank you for the lesson in Jesus' name. Amen.